Chapter fifty eight of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. Women of History by Anonymous. Chapter fifty eight. Madame des Ursins. Born sixteen forty, died seventeen twenty two. Saint Simon. When this extraordinary woman was appointed Camarera Mayor to the Queen of Philip V of Spain, she was a widow without children. No one could have been better suited for the post. A lady of the French court would not have done. A Spanish lady was not to be depended on, and might have easily disgusted the Queen. The Princesse des Ursins appeared to be a middle term. She was French, had been in Spain, and she passed a great part of her life at Rome and in Italy. She was of the house of Tremoille, Anne Maria de la Tremoille. She first married Monsieur Talleyrand, who called himself Prince de Chalet. She followed her husband to Spain, where he died. Her second husband was chief of the house of Ursin, a grandee of Spain, and the prince of the Soglio. Age and health were also appropriate, and likewise her appearance. She was rather tall than otherwise, a brunette with blue eyes of the most varied expression in figure perfect, with a most exquisite bosom. Her face, without being beautiful, was charming. She was extremely noble in air, very majestic in demeanour, full of graces so natural and continual in everything that I have never seen any one approach her in either form or mind. Her wit was copious, and of all kinds. She was flattering, caressing, insinuating, moderate, wishing to please for pleasing's sake, with charms irresistible when she strove to persuade and win over. Accompanying all this, she had a grandeur that encouraged instead of frightening, a delicious conversation, inexhaustible and very amusing, for she had seen many countries and persons, a voice and way of speaking extremely agreeable and full of sweetness. She knew how to choose the best society, how to receive them, and could have held a court, was polite, distingué, and above all was careful never to take a step in advance without dignity and discretion. She was eminently fitted for intrigue in which, from taste, she had passed her life in Rome, with much ambition, but of that vast kind far above her sex and the common run of men, a desire to occupy a great position and to govern. A love for gallantry and personal vanity were her foibles, and these clung to her until her latest day, Consequently, she dressed in a way that no longer became her, and as she advanced in life, removed further from propriety in this particular. She was an ardent and excellent friend, of a friendship that time and absence never enfeebled, and, consequently, an implacable enemy, pursuing her hatred to the infernal regions. While caring little for the means by which she gained her ends, she tried as much as possible to reach them by honest means. Secret not only for herself, but for her friends, she was yet of a decorous gaiety, and so governed her humours that at all times and in everything she was mistress of herself. From the first moment on which she entered the service of the Queen of Spain it became her desire to govern not only the Queen, but the King, and by this means the realm itself. Such a grand project had need of support from our King, Louis the Fourteenth who at the commencement ruled the court of Spain as much as his own court, with entire influence over all other matters. The young queen of Spain had not been less carefully educated than her sister, the Duchesse de Bourgogne. She had even, when so young, much intelligence and firmness, without being incapable of restraint. Indeed, she became a divinity among the Spaniards, and, to their affection for her, Philip was more than once indebted for his crown. Madame des Ursins soon managed to obtain the entire confidence of this queen, and during the absence of Philip V in Italy, assisted her in the administration of all public offices. She even accompanied her to the junta, it not being thought proper that the queen should be alone amidst such an assemblage of men. In this way she became acquainted with everything that was passing, and knew all the affairs of government. This step gained, it will be imagined that the Princesse des Ursins did not forget to pay her court most assiduously to our King and Madame de Maintenon. 
Little by little she introduced into her letters details respecting public affairs, without, however, conveying a suspicion of her own ambition. She next began to flatter Madame de Maintenon, and to hint that she might rule over Spain even more firmly than she ruled over France, if she would entrust her command to Madame des Ursins. Madame de Maintenon was enchanted by the siren, and embraced the proposition with avidity. It was next necessary to draw the King of Spain into the same net, not a very arduous task. Soon the junta became a mere show. Everything was brought before the King in private, and he gave no decision until the Queen and Madame des Ursins passed theirs. This rule Madame des Ursins continued for many years. Ultimately a quarrel with Madame de Maintenon, the death of the Queen of Spain, and the second marriage of the King with the cabals of the enemies forced her in her old age into a retreat at Rome. She was not long there before she attached herself to the King and Queen of England, the Pretender and his wife, and soon governed them openly. What a poor resource! But it was courtly, and had the flavour of occupation for a woman who could not exist without movement. She finished her life there, remarkably healthy in mind and body, and in a prodigious opulence which was not without its use in that deplorable court. She had the pleasure of seeing Madame de Maintenon, forgotten and annihilated at Saint-Cyr, of surviving her, of seeing at Rome her two enemies, Guidis and Alberoni, as profoundly disgraced as she. Her death, which a few years before would have resounded through all Europe, made not the least sensation. End of chapter 58